Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about making sewer bases. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I'm making these for a big Skaven project I'm doing and uh, I'm going to walk you through exactly the steps I do to get there. Uh, sewers are fun because you can do anything you want. Unlike many other bases where we can go out and reference reality, most sewers in the real world don't look like the sewers of the fantasy worlds that are eight or nine feet high with you know, extra 10 feet across, and uh, they have multiple levels and layers to them, and hidden doors and secret dungeons and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so instead, we get to explore the realm of our imagination. I'm going to make a couple different bases here with you today, and obviously this is all happening at two times speed, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what I'm doing. Uh, my little workshop that you see me, or my little palette that I'm working on top of there, is all gross because I'm going to use... Uh, some clay and I don't like to get my normal mat all gross. So the first thing I want to do on my sewer is build up some height. I want to show the difference between what will eventually be the sewer and the water. So I'm going to use our old friend cork. So you saw how I laid the thing down, measured out a space, drew around it with a pen, and then took a very sharp exacto and cut it out. I'm then going to glue it down and that'll provide me a real nice height change uh, for, for that. Uh, you can do sort of any structure you could imagine here. That is to say, it doesn't have to be like I did with this sort of straight cut across the middle. And as a point of fact, I do a bunch of different bases uh, throughout my Skaven army because I had to do nine of these 120 mil bases. So I had all sorts of different configurations, some with water, some without, so on and so forth. Don't worry if the cork doesn't cut exactly perfect. That doesn't matter. It's just fine. We'll clean it up later. We're going to cover everything with clay. Uh, namely, in this, we're going to use some DOS modeling clay. Uh, now, you can use any kind of thing over the top of this. You can use green stuff, brown stuff, gray stuff. You can use milliput of any variety, and so on and so forth. I'm using DOS modeling clay. Uh, because that's what I want. If you're going to use Milliput, as you just saw there, use super fine white. This DOS is really good. You can get huge amounts, quite cheap, and it's air drying modeling clay. It's actually really nice for making bases. Um, I love it. And because you just get so much for a relatively low price. And again, I had to make something like 300 of these bases. So I didn't want to be bankrupt, which is what green stuff would have done. <laughs> and even Milliput was too expensive. So uh, you lay down a nice chunk, and you notice I'm just kind of working it smooth. Now, unlike Milliput, you don't really have to keep your fingers super wet. It's not very tacky. It won't really stick to your fingers a huge amount. Uh, what I do here is just take a little water kind of at the end, and I'll, I'll smooth it out, and you'll see me do that. But just start with a nice sized chunk, and then I start leveling it out. I'm just using my finger to even it out over the bases. So I've got both a big chariot style 120 mil by 90 base as well as a small 32 mil round here and in both cases we're going to make room for a little sewer water to be flowing by because that'll be fun the what you see me doing there is just making sure it's nice and flush to that cork uh, then i take just a little bit of water on my finger and i'm just smoothing it down it doesn't need to be perfectly completely smooth but here's a good trick to do so get it nice and wet Okay, like you see me doing there, where you see me flatten everything out uh, completely. And then one of the things you can do, once you've gotten rid of most of the big bumps that you can, make sure your desk is nice and wet, flip the base over, and then press it down really hard into kind of the wet, flat cutting mat. Uh, it will make your mat very stained and ugly. <laughs> But it will give you a nice flat surface, and we're just going to cut off the extra extra layer, so it's not a big deal. Um, but I'm keeping... Notice that I don't go in with my finger totally wet. I wiped it on the mat first, just to make sure that I had that extra there. Next thing I'm going to do is I want to make some texture in this. Uh, you can do that in any way you like. You could manually sculpt in the texture. You could, uh, you could sit there and... and uh, put in some elements that you want in a press that you made yourself, or you can do what I'm doing here, which is a good old-fashioned green stuff roller. This is the Madness Roller, which is a mix of sort of cobblestones and weird um, otherworldly icons, which I really liked. Uh, you don't want your... Either the... If you're using DOS, 
you don't want either the clay or the roller to be like super soaked. You want them to both be moist. Uh, if you miss a spot, you see I just rolled into there. Boom, now I've got some texture there. Job's a good one. Doesn't need to be perfect. It's meant to be an underground sewer and you're good to go. If you have uh, any spaces where you wanna make some extra bricks, you can always go in with anything. I'm just using a set of, uh, of, of tweezers here and you see me literally just putting some more bricks into it. Uh, you know, kind of making them aligned with everything else. Once this is all painted and I have moss over the top and mud and everything like that, any tiny inconsistencies, you won't even notice anymore. And that's one of the keys. You don't really want to worry about getting hung up, hung up on this. I see some people get really worried if, if their roll doesn't come out completely perfect. They get really hung up on that. In the end, you shouldn't ever just stop with the roller. You can always have other stuff on top, but you can always have other detritus in the in there you know whether it's a sewer like i'm doing here or whether it's um or whether it's you know any other kind of thing you might be rolling now the next thing i want to do is i want to recut my space and make it nice and flat but i'm only going to do that straight cut i'm not going to peel the edges right now and the reason for that is because if you try to cut areas that are wet this is what will happen Notice how it started to pull. That'll happen with green stuff, with milliput, with this clay, with anything. When it's super wet still, it's gonna, it's not gonna give you a clean cut. So instead, we're just gonna let it dry. So I let it sit for about 24 hours, which is when, how long I would leave anything, the air drying clay or, or milliput or anything like that. Now I'm just gonna take my big, uh, my big cutter and I'm just gonna slice off all that excess and I can get a nice clean cut nothing gets pulled i don't make any new divots or holes or anything like that all right so i can get a nice straight cut and i can sand it down if i want to so this just gives me a, a ton of additional options right so there i'm just doing some quick sanding just to get rid of any roughness to my cut and boom we've got a nice smooth line if you're still not getting it perfectly smooth you can always take just a small amount of putty or something like that and, uh, and you can just wet that out and work it around the side. So if you wanna get a really perfect edge, that's all you gotta do. It'll take a little extra putty. Then it's time to clean up the straight line at the edge and we're good to go. Same thing on the little base. Just give it a little trim. I can give it a little sand if I want. And, uh, and there you go. Again, as with the case, a lot of times you don't need to actually get into the sanding. Most time it's, it'll be perfectly good enough with just your your knife as long as you take a nice smooth cut out of it i end up working this a few times sanding it a few times just to make sure it's where i where it's where i uh, i want to be now the next thing i want to do when i'm thinking about a sewer is i don't just want the sewer to drop off into the water um, when i think of how people would construct this sort of i don't know this sort of structure uh i i think about the fact that there would be some kind of break point, some kind of extra construction that would show the line between the place where someone's supposed to walk and the edge of the water. There would be like a break. So I'm going to use these little tiny bricks. Um, I ordered a whole bunch of these uh, from Michigan Toy Soldier. Great place to get all your, your modeling stuff from. They're not a sponsor or anything. I just really like their store. And I think they're nice people who ship things very well and have a great selection. Uh, and so I'm just putting a little super glue along and making myself a little line of bricks right across there. And what that gives me is just, it breaks up the two sections of the base with a nice little visual cue. I'll do it on the little one as well. Uh, and I really love how this looks. I think it just gives you the feel once we add the water later, that there's absolutely a dividing line between these two sections. It just feels more natural. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and, you know, stick the bricks to my fingers like a genius. So once that's all in there and I've got that space lined out, it really helps me create a separation. But something does have to stand on the space. And because I chose to just do half of it as this and half of it as water, I need something out in the middle of the area where I can then put like the other leg of a fig or whatever, if that's what I'm trying to do, right? So... Uh, I'm gonna make myself a little island. And again, I'm gonna use the same bricks. You see, I'm just 
lay down some glue and I'm just going to drop them into place using some tweezers. Now, I won't stop with just these bricks. And my thought pattern here was this is probably some little uh, area out in the middle of the water that's raised up for some reason or another. Um, could be any any reason why that's happening. Uh, but I'll also put some mud around it later, um, which you'll see as we keep going forward. Uh, but things like this, again, when you're dealing with sewers, and it's so much just a thing that you're imagining, it's really all about... Um, it's really all about creating an image of something that feels realistic or feels imaginative. Most sewers in the world, like there, there are some very crazy sewer systems in the world, but even then they're not fantasy level sewers that are like, <laughs> that are, uh, as I said earlier, you know, unbelievably tall or huge or full of, uh, secret dungeons. What I'm doing here is is a little interesting trick playing with the edge of the universe so i created a tiny little raised cork thing that i'll put mud around later and i'm just going to slice it flat so it's a little more of like a looks like more of just the side of a wall and then once i have this little outcropping cut flat what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a pipe on top so let's talk about how you make sewer pipes one of the easiest ways to make sewer pipes are these little plastic uh, tips that come on your paintbrushes. Whenever you buy paintbrushes, you often get these little plastic tips on them. By the way, you get, even if you buy cheap bulk uh, paintbrushes, like as I often do, just cheap synthetics in a big pack, uh, you usually get these little plastic tips on them. I always save them uh, because they're just infinitely useful as pipes. Um, I use these all the time in, in bases and dioramas. So I cut the pipe to the exact angle of the edge of the base or the little, you know, little plastic piece. And then I glued it to the top of that. So it'll give me the chance, if I want later, to have some some goo streaming down into the lake or look like this is a, uh, an access tunnel or something to, that, you know, dumps into this uh, cistern or whatever. Now I'm going to take the same exact, uh, a different one, but I'm going to take, you know, another little, little brush uh, tip protector and I'm going to cut it directly in half. And... When it's in half, I'm going to make myself a little pipe that's halfway submerged in the water. So I kind of just slide it over there, glue it down, and now I'll have a half-submerged pipe. Uh, pretty cool trick overall. Um, I really like messing around with like pipes and sewers and stuff like that because you can just kind of go nuts. Uh, if you've got old chain or chains like discarded jewelry chain or a lot of miniature kits come with extra chains or things like that sure just take some of those and throw them on the base take some skulls throw them on the base take uh some rats from your scaven kits throw them on the base all that stuff is possible now what i'm going to do is i want to add a little texture it wouldn't all be just the sewers down here it makes sense that there would also be other sorts of textures going on probably like areas where mud has gathered because storms you know at some point there was a big storm and the sewage overflowed its normal bounds and got up there and then left behind some gross dirt or something like that right so i'm just taking some vallejo thick mud way to work right on camera vince that's uh that's a plus work right there and uh i'm just spreading it around uh and i'm just gonna put it in all of these areas that are around the bricks and around stuff like where there could be areas of mud. You can go nuts here. You can put it on top of your previous work. You can put it around things. Like you could have some around the pipe where maybe there's a buildup. If you have areas of the brick that are kind of um, not as well defined, like if your roller kind of skipped a beat there and you didn't quite get it as flat as you wanted, hey, throw a little dirt on top, bada boom, problem solved, right? So now I have all that mud all laid out. You can also texture this. You can put little rocks or grit or anything like that around. So the key is just to be imaginative and uh, and think of anything like that you want. Here I've got a little glue. I'm going to do just that. I'm going to take a little, little. this is a PVA glue and water mixture. I'm going to kind of spread that around and uh, in, a, in a couple places I find interesting. That'll also make a nice mortar, by the way, when you lay down the bricks. This like water PVA glue mixture is a great mortar if you're doing these bricks individually. So, 
Uh, then I'm just going to take some little rocks and just kind of throw them on here and just go nuts. Uh, this will give me some other interesting texture on this area of the base. Just some more fun stuff to break up the base. And that's the key. The more little things we have, the more interesting this becomes. All right, so everything is dry and I went ahead and primed the, the base. Gave it a little sort of zenithal type, little grise cover of just black and white. And you notice that I kept my white at an angle. When you're dealing with flat bases like this, you always want there to be uh, an angle you're operating from, okay? Because the more you uh, are playing with that individual angle, uh, the more interesting the lighting scheme is gonna become. So now what I'm doing is something that I would not recommend you do, but I did because I'm dumb. Uh, so, what I am doing is I am painting back in all the mud. Now let me talk about how I should have done this. What I should have done was after I did the black, I should have done just a coat of brown, this same sort of mahogany brown and black that I'm currently painting in all these thin lines in. I should have done that over everything. Then I should have come in at my deep angle and done the white because most of these recesses stay dark. So all I would have needed to do then is pick out the little tiny areas that didn't get properly or that accidentally got a little too covered. Instead, I forgot to do that, and so I had to go back in and do it afterward. That took a long time on 300 bases, but learn from my mistakes and do things the right way. Uh, the reason that I'm painting those back in is because contrast is king. Whenever you're dealing with sewers or anything that's going to be cobblestones, you want that area in between to be nice and dark. Now what I'm going to do is a little wet blend over the remaining cobblestones. And I chose some interesting colors for this, and I'll explain why. So I've got some ice yellow, some deck tan, some mahogany, and then I use a little bit of that, the darkest, like my uh, Payne's Gray blue-black ink. Okay? And you notice my brush is at an absolutely almost horizontal angle here to this thing. That way when I'm moving, I'm only hitting the raised areas. Okay? Now I'm gonna start with that ice yellow and then slowly integrate that deck tan, which is like a sort of nice, I don't know, kind of mid-range gray warm color. It's hard to explain. It's it's a very popular color. I, I love it. It's a great, nice mid gray. So I use it all the time. Then I'm gonna take that mahogany. I'm gonna work it in from the other side. Again, only hitting the bricks and hit the bricks. Uh, and then I'm gonna wet blend all of this together, right? So I'm just, you notice how fat, like, I understand this is sped up, but I'm working very fast across this large space. Using fairly thick paint, spreading it out, working it together, and that gives me this wonderful gradient from bright yellow to red. As though there's like a bright thing out in the water that's casting light. If I messed anything up, I just go in and clean it up real fast. Yeah, see, again, things I would have saved myself pain by uh, doing properly to begin with, but I didn't. Uh, but that contrast, you can see how well those stones stand out, even the darker stones, when they're against that dark brown-black mud, okay? Contrast is, the, is king with cobblestones. Now, the reason I picked yellow to red is very simple. In the end, the entire base is going to glow green, okay? Everything's going to have a green tint to it. So why did I pick yellow and red? because the green is gonna be a, a somewhat soft OSL effect. And so to make that really pop, the yellow has this very high lumosity and the yellow under the green I'm gonna use will make it have a sort of sickly poisoned glow. When green hits red, okay, it becomes brown and darker and becomes a shadow color. So with this gradient, of yellow to gray to red, I'm actually creating an undershade for what's going to eventually be my green color. All right. And you'll see how that looks when we get to some later steps. So what I'm focused on here, I'm just wet blending out those bricks out in the middle of the water. Um, I'll end up black lining those at some point as well. Yep. There we go. Because again, contrast still key. You want those little bricks to stand out from each other. I'm also painting the mud that's around the uh, 
around everything here, all that mud, nice dark brown, black color, same as my mud up top, uh, making sure that's like that. Uh, because this is more mud, I just took a little lighter brown and like, you know, did a quick dry brush over the top. Doesn't need to be anything special. Most of that is gonna end up submerged under a resin pour. So it just needs to look like submerged mud. You don't need to really worry about it too much, okay? All right, so now it's time to actually turn the water green. We're not gonna use this on the rocks, not just yet. And the reason I'm doing this is because that's where my resin pour is gonna be, but I don't want to do that uh, until I've actually colored the base. I'm using some green skin flesh here. You do not want to do a colored resin pour over your standard zenithal. That's a quick way to make the water look really, really shallow and ugly. You want all these different levels of undershading to show through. So I lay down a nice green, and then I'm going to create some deeper shadows where it looks like basically, in this case, I'm going to spray near the, um, near the, yeah, exactly, near the edge. So it makes it look like uh, there's something casting a shadow there. And again, there's this glow out in the water. If you're doing the ocean, you want it to be brighter near the shore or near the edge and deeper, darker near the deeper part. But here, because I want there to be this alien glow out in the sewers, hence it's, uh, we're going that direction instead. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my, uh, my green color, my green skin flesh, and mix it with a whole lot of fluorescent. This is the fluorescent ink from Green Stuff World. And I make myself a real nice thin mixture and I'm gonna spray it real thin at this angle. And you see me just doing a lot of passes, okay? And I'm starting to just tint that green, right? And I'm gonna do the same thing out on the little bricks. And the wonderful part here is it's it's not gonna hurt the anything else. This green is so weak it basically won't affect the the um, the dark brown at all, and but you see how once that's put over there and dry, right? I oh by the way, I blew a little too much. That was me just sopping up a little puddle. Sometimes that can happen with your airbrush. No issue. Just grab a brush, sop up your extra. You're good to go. Okay. Once I've got my nice green tint on the rocks. And again, I didn't want it to be overpowering, just to give a nice feel of something alien. I still want the water to be the most green. All right, so speaking of water, let's get ourselves ready for that. Uh, I painted all the metallics off camera. Those were just me laying down some metallics. And that's one of the important things is you need to do everything else before you do the, you do the resin pour. It should always be your last step. Now I'm gonna make moss. I might do a whole video on this later, just on doing moss. But I lay down some super glue and then I grab some tiny little green flock like you used to make uh, model train tables. And I'm just gonna spread it around in that super glue. Um, some thin super glue is generally gonna serve you the best here. So if you've got like a super glue thin, you see a glue thin or something, that's gonna be your best. So I lay that down and then I'm just gonna dump that all out. I didn't wanna dump it on my desk because it's impossible to get rid of, so I dumped it in the trash. And you can see how now, ta-da, look at that. There's little bits of clumpy moss left. As always though, we're not gonna let it just be like that. Of course, of course not. Uh, we have to also paint it. So I have to let all that super glue dry because I don't wanna get paint on something wet. We're back, that's dry now. So it didn't take that long. And uh, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some paint into that moss. I start with some Agrax Earthshade and I'm just gonna go ahead and dip that into some of the areas that are more recessed or that I want to be darker. When it first goes in there, it's gonna be pretty dark. You can thin it if you want a more subtle effect. You know, just mix a little water in. It will sop down in there and this stuff will drink that wash right up, okay? You can easily tint this stuff in a lot of different colors by playing with the, the different washes. It actually looks really cool when you put a little bit of like the um, red wash in it. Now I'm taking a little fluorescent green from uh, War Colors and I'm just spreading it around on the edge of the moss to make it look like there's some bioluminescence to it, right? So this is actually moss that's kind of glowing underwater. Now once everything dries here, it's all gonna pull together a little bit. The green doesn't dry 
quite this bright as it's showing on camera and the dark doesn't dry quite as dark, right? So I am going to let all of that dry and then I'm gonna do my resin pour. Uh, I'm not gonna do that part on camera because, or actually I do think I do it on camera, sorry. I'm a liar. Um, the, I wanna talk about though what I got myself ready for. So you'll notice that there's this little edge around my base and that is blue tack. Uh, what I just showed you on camera was the Green Stuff World silicon molds. They're okay. I will say they don't generally work with GW bases because those have a slight trapezoidal shape to them. These are MDF bases. They can work, but I didn't have one big enough. They're okay. They will leak some. This way I found to be much better. So I take new strips of blue tack and I just work it around the edge of the base and then tuck it underneath and make sure it's nice and stuck. Then I take my realistic water, I mix it with that green skin flesh, some green ink, and some of that fluorescent and a little bit of yellow ink. And I make a big, sickly green liquid measure. Look at that. Look how gross and wonderful that looks. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. I was really happy with this mix. I didn't have any particular ratio. I just kept mixing it all until I loved what it looked like. Then I'm going to take a little pipette, and I'm just going to slowly start working. This is at two times speed, remember? So this is how slow I'm moving around this thing. Slowly work my way around. I try to get a nice smooth drink of it from the uh, from the thing and then slowly work my way in. And the reason I'm working so slow, not blowing it all out, and the reason I'm being so careful about drawing it up is because then I don't get bubbles everywhere. Bubbles are the enemy when you're uh, doing resin pours. So I just kind of work it. You notice I never go all the way to the edge. Instead, I mostly let the just natural capillary action and the spread of this stuff slowly flatten out. I also put a little bit in that pipe just to look like there's a little bit in there. And if there is a couple bubbles, as there always will be, I just take my X-Acto and I pop the little bubbles. So with that, that base is basically ready to go it just needs to dry uh the only other thing i'm going to add and this is a completely optional step is some bubbles because who doesn't love who doesn't love intentional bubbles and this is what's so funny about this process you pop your fake bubbles the ones that are like the ones that happen sorry you pop your real bubbles i apologize the ones that happen naturally because they will cause the resin to cure in a bad way and then they'll break and you'll just have this big hole, this big void in your pour. But it is cool to have real bubbles in there. So for that, I grabbed a silica packet. These often come in things that are shipped to you, things you buy where you can just get little silica packets. And I just drop a couple little round silica balls in there. The resin will cure around them. They're clear, so they'll take on the color. And suddenly you have real in scale, perfectly believable bubbles. So now it's just a matter of letting that all dry. And you'll see some pictures here at the end. Uh, but as always, uh, thank you very much for watching this. I hope this was cool. I hope you enjoy the pictures. I did do a whole bunch of these. Uh, give it a like if you like it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. If you've got any questions, drop those down below. But as always, I thank you so much for watching this one. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.